Uh, so, uh, my name is Somu Datta. I'm from Department of Electrical Engineering, also associated with the Center of Names and Nanophotonics, uh, Solar Energy Harnessing Center, as well as uh, AMOLED Display Lab. Uh, <clears throat> so, the topic is uh, organic electronics from materials to devices. Uh, so, the, the brief outline of my talk is uh, the following that uh, I'll just spend some time on my uh, you know research activities just to introduce some of these activities and then I'll come to the my uh, major problem I mean, my main problem the organic electronics just like uh, how to develop from materials to device and some of these fun research activities which I, I thought uh, it would be nice to share uh, so let's say um, uh, so introduction to my research activities uh, the way I work on the, our group work is, is the following. So we basically uh, take the ingredient and make some food and serve it. So that is the basic uh, protocol we follow and yeah, jokes apart. So what we start with, with the noble materials and we develop, uh, uh, just a, we develop uh, some technology around it. Uh, to make some conventional devices from the unconventional materials and look for some applications. So that is the basic uh, protocol we follow. Uh, the materials uh, looks like uh, something like organic semiconductors, organic dialectics. So we make uh, devices out of that. I would try to apply some kind of flexible circuits or those are the applications which, which we are looking for. We also use uh, uh, some polymer which is piezoelectric in nature and we make some of this surface acoustic device which actually works like you know electrical to mechanical energy and mechanical to electrical energy transduction so you can see some of these things waves are moving so basically electrical signal will be transmitted to mechanical wave and that wave will be transmitted and at the output port it will be again transduced as a mechanical to electrical wave and then it will be uh, taken out okay and while this transport of these waves actually it encounters anything on the surface it, it actually responds with change so that's a very nice sensor device uh, so now uh, there's nothing new on this device uh, but except the materials because this is uh, something unpredictable material on that and this is the number 450 megahertz is something which is the highest report as so far it is uh, because it's very difficult to achieve such kind of thing uh, on polymer we, devices. We can write. Uh, so yeah, we also use uh, reduced graphene oxide, which is very well known uh, for some some graphene derivatives. So we, we try to make some kind of resonator device out of that. So it has uh, some vibration, and we can use it for some kind of sensors and all. Uh, we also used, uh, I mean, we work on the solar cell using organic semiconductors, perovskite, uh, we use for other things like transistors, uh, some pneumomorphic applications using uh, this perovskite material, also some other, other uh, organic materials to make some other devices. So basically, uh, materials to technology uh, to, to get uh, some conventional devices, that's the, that's the motive. Now, if we look at uh, what we are looking for, actually, to, to start with any any kind of technology or any device. Uh, so what we look, first of all, is that the two parameters, one is the scalability, I mean, two uh, metrics, that one is the scalability, that how small you can make, what is the capability to make it scalable, okay, to, so that we can introduce more uh, number of devices into the same footprint. Uh, at the same time, it should be uh, reproducible, it should be batch processing, so that we can make you know, multiple uh, substrates uh, to have the same time you can get you know more number of devices so that way uh, you can reduce the cost basically okay so this is these are the two things which is very important uh, for making the device it is not a single device which will work and we can say okay we have achieved it it's not like that because we have to think about the future so uh, for example uh, this is a suspended bridge right it's, it's very well known uh, bridge so it's suspended between two pillars okay and and the same structure we can make uh, on the chip right so if you, if you think of some graphene it is just suspended between two uh, pillars uh, it will it will be like look like something like this so this is the cross-sectional uh, diagram and you can actually apply some field and that will actuate this uh, suspended structure okay and that will have some frequency 
and that fundamental frequency is related to the ion modulus of the film and the mass density now if you look at the graphene ion modulus is, is very high and the mass density is very low so if you look at this then we can think about very high frequency application right and uh, this frequency depends on the mass density so anything sits on the mass I mean, if you think about some kind of uh, you know, uh, receptors and if it sits there so it can be a very sensitive uh, uh, sensor so that was the, some some kind of motivation so to work with again we have to look at you know what is the feasibility it's not like simple flake okay it's just one micro flake it's not doable so we have to look at little bit large frame and that is something like i mean what i'm talking about let's say at least two inch by two inch film so we, we, we work with our geo film which is kind of spin portable or uh, it can be also easily available and this is easily processable also okay so we started with that and uh, well uh, this is again we have to pattern it we have to design it a different uh, form factor so for that we need to pattern it so whatever size you want for making a device so it should be isolated and you can make a nice pattern on that now this is also not enough because it, it is not the substrate so this substrate is made up for uh, this particular film now if you want some different substrate where actually the devices will fabricate it, you have to transfer it there. So you need to have the transfer technology also. Okay, so you just transfer it as it is as a pattern structure and you transfer on different substrates. It's the same way like a like a seal, right? So you can take the ink and you stamp it wherever you need. So, but this is all uh, reproducible and uh, it is also scalable. That is very important. I mean, that needs to be like that. It's not manually, you can fill it up or like that. So we, we, we do, did this one and finally we, we achieved some proof of concept of the suspended bridge which is 5 nanometer thick uh, film uh, and this, this acts like a resonator but it's not definitely it's not a good resonator we are working on that and we are actually making some kind of readout circuits together to have some gas sensor. So anyway this is ongoing process I just gave some examples so that is what we have to look from any material to Come to the device uh, to travel some of this technology associated so these are the uh, sub facilities available in our lab uh, group box uh, uh, existing facility uh, you know, fabrication facility I think that is good enough for uh, you know uh, fabrication and, and analysis or characterization process we have recently developed some amulet display lab uh, that is actually one of the uh, first uh, amulet display lab in india so we will be doing lots of uh, we'll produce uh, interesting diesel in, in a couple of years we're expecting okay let's come to the uh, the main topics is the organic electronics uh, which is uh, my core area of research uh, so how to come from material to devices so uh, let me uh, let me show you some of these things so it's, it's actually very promising at this moment so if you look at the market size normally you know many materials are around but you know some of these materials are really have some meaningful research can be done so this is like market size is quite decent and uh, this 40 billion dollar market and most of this revenue is coming from the display as you know that you know samsung mobile phone whatever display is there it's actually a display is made of uh, organic semiconductors organic data uh, <clears throat> some of this usp is like it's a low cost low temperature process flexible light emission possible very up to i mean high of electronic properties are there very and then uh, roll to roll printable process is possible so these are some of this form factor which is which is uh, good and which can be utilized so some yeah some of the uh, you know uh, prototypes are uh, shown now i'll i'll discuss about some some very specific uh, device here uh, obviously there are so many devices and it's not uh, easy to discuss all of them we don't have much time so it is it's a very specific device it's called organic thin field transistor okay and it's a, it's a fundamental of uh, basic circuits okay so how it works it's a very simple structure and very interesting structure too because it is the structure consists of three metal electrodes source strain and gain it has semiconductor which is a purple color and insulator now uh, this is the uh, only one device structure i can think of it where you have metal insulator and semiconductor together okay so that's that's why it's, it's a very interesting structure now how it works so source and drain to two electrodes and you can 
take some resistance between that so that is just like a resistor applied. Now if you apply some negative voltage here, so negative charge will be accumulated and because of that this is just like a capacitor so positive charge will be accumulated here. So that way it will make a conductive cell. Okay, so the conductivity will increase. Now, on the other hand if you apply positive gate bias then the holes will be depleted from here and you will see kind of insulating so there will be no current at all. I mean uh, it's a very low current here. So what you can do is you can change the conductivity from low to high or high to low by just applying gate voltage. So this is nothing but the switch application. Okay? And uh, if you see the characteristics, uh, you can see that you know as we apply positive gate voltage, the current is low. If you apply negative gate voltage, the current is high. That's just, just like a switch. Now what is the application? If you look at the application, see this is, uh, there are several applications, but one of this very uh, promising application and potential app, uh, you know, candidate for this is the AMOLED uh, backplane. Okay, so the AMOLED displays to totally, I mean, these are all pixels are made up of LEDs. Okay, and each LED having this kind of circuit. So, what it does is suppose I want a red LED to particular pixel to activate. So, I want this line to on. So, I, I will apply some high voltage, and because of high voltage, this switch will be on. Because we know that uh, if you apply sudden gate voltage, this will conduct. So that means this switch will be on. Then it will accumulate all the charges here. So this will be high voltage. Then again it will be on. And if you apply this voltage, so this switch will be on. So that current will flow and it will trigger this particular LED and it will show you red, red light. That means red pixel will be on. So similarly, I mean, whatever uh, you want, you can actually make uh, whatever uh, in a particular uh, LED to on. So that needs a this transistor basic circuits or basic transistor structure. But by the way, this is not the final structure. I mean, the kind of display is available. It is not the similar. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but I just made it just for simplicity. Okay. There are also applications like in healthcare, there are lots of, you know, skin electronics, it's called. So you can use some kind of pulse measurement uh, display and those kind of thing. Uh, on your skin, so these are all are coming, and there is uh, there is no Intel, no, there is no uh, IBM kind of. I mean, there is no competitors because uh, it is like you know your own market. You, if you can make it, uh, if you have the capability, you can do it. Something like that. So we are definitely you are not looking for five G application like high frequency application. Okay, so we have definitely the mobility is low. So we have to limit it within the low frequency application, for example, the display back pen circuits or some of this amplifiers for sensors, RFIT tag uh, under low frequency. So those are the applications which can be flexible and uh, can be applicable in a, in a low frequency domain. So that's, that's kind of uh, the target applications we can take off. So what are the key challenges? The first challenge what we feel is the coordination between the materials, device and circuit. That's the, that's a basic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the barrier for making this research. And that's that's where uh, we are trying in, in, at my IIT Madras to, to reduce the gap between these three chains. The, but anyway, this is all non-technical. So if you look at the technical part, uh, let's say I want to switch this little faster. So I need the frequency to be high. This is the operating frequency and how it depends. It depends on the mobility of the charge carriers, how fast this charge carrier moves. It depends on the voltage between these two electrodes. Now, if you want to increase the uh, frequency, you can increase either the mobility or the voltage. Now, voltage increase is not a good idea because it will consume more power. Right? So we have only mobility and we have also lane scale that the overlapping lane, channel lane, all this lane scale. Now, the mobility is mostly is a materials property. So we, we, we cannot do much on that. Okay, so the device phase, what we can do is we can look over this part. Okay, so that's the target. Uh, let's do what we can do. So we can reduce all these lanes. And if we can reduce this lane scale, then actually you can achieve some high frequency application. So that is the uh, kind of motivation here. So we have to make uh, high throughput mass production that means the process should be you know reproducible and it should be unique uh, it should have a scalability obviously you can reduce the size and obviously you have to understand the science because there are lots of things are happening which which is beyond our understanding okay 
So the way we, we proposed it, we used a polymer dialectic because this is something low cost, it's flexible because that is where our challenge is. It is solution based technology so it, it can be printable okay, in, in some sense. Uh, now again we need to have the microelectronic technology which is normally used for silicon CMOS technology right so but 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 we know that this is very reproducible technology now it, it can have scalability mass production all these things but the combining these two is a big challenge okay so anyway we, we worked we started with that that we will we'll make this kind of structure so polymer and then the semiconductor and electrodes all these things and this is the semiconductor and insulator the transparent is the insulator and the, this this orange color is the semiconductor so the, these are all solution form right uh, uh, other than this structure this is uh, is called mis capacitor structure it is actually to understand that how we can switch this so how you have to make the change in the you know uh, the electric i mean the charges here right so how you can switch these charges okay so that to understand that it's basically is it's a very similar structure this two okay here you have uh, the gold and uh, the semiconductor dialectic and the other metal so this is very similar so if you try to understand this structure this is very uh, fundamental structure which is also used for traditional silicon technology okay that's nothing new here okay. uh, now we have to first develop the technology to make it happen and also you have to understand the science okay these are the two aspects where we started with now we use uh, standard technology which is like lithography where you use this kind of polymer again it's a photoresist and if it is exposed to uv then the portion which is exposed it will be actually very loose you can dissolve it so to make a nice pattern so this is a very standard technology it's nothing again nothing new but what the problem is uh, up to this point you can make the gate structure okay on glass substrate now on top then you you make this polymer dialectic this is blue in color on top you make this window so that uh, metal will sit and at the end you need to remove this uh, green color for uh, photoresist to make this structure now here is the challenge because you need to have a stripper solution which is very standard uh, for lithography so now, if you use this solution solvent then most of this dialectic will be uh, you know it will be damaged and if you see you know this is the first trial where we see this has happened okay so this is obviously it is not the way to do so we have to do lots of uh, solvent uh, chemistry to understand how we can protect this layer i'm not going into the details of that okay so but somehow we overcome this problem and we have plenty of different types of devices for example here we use uh, cross-link poly poly and polyvinyl phenol as, as, as a dialectic material here we use PMA as a dialectic material, so all are transparent, and on top we make this structure. Okay, and this is something it's it's not really insulator related. This is again the RGO structure. So this blue color is RGO. So these are actually used as a as a drain source. That means it is used as a metal. So this also work like a transistor. So all are various different types of transistors. So we are, we, are, we are capable of doing that now. I'm not going to the details of this fabrication process obviously so what i want to know some of this interesting challenge and interesting understanding here because as i told that this is a basic structure right so now it is it is metal you have the insulator you have semiconductor you have another metal so now traditionally for silicon also this the same structure is used and that is uh, the equivalent circuit is as if there are two uh, dialectic material or two capacitors are around now if you make it more charged that means if with some voltage let's say in the negative voltage as you saw that there are lots of holes that means it will be very highly charged so that will use that will be kind of a metal so ultimately you will have all these things are metal this is metal and this is your insulator so your your capacitance will be quite high okay on the other hand if you don't have this charge carriers then it will be like an insulator so you have two insulator and the thickness is high so capacitance will be low that's why you will, you will get a low capacitance that's the basic understanding of this of this structure okay uh, and uh, once we saw that this is coming like this okay now so, Tomio, uh, 20 minutes over okay. okay can i have five minutes is it possible yes you have five minutes okay fine that is good enough so what we tried is we, we try to understand that okay how it is depending on the charge carrier so that is the normal uh, you know uh, traditional method 
where you can find the doping concentration and doping concentrated means this is the source of the charge and that can be extracted from this slope. Now what we found is that is what people used to say in this community that okay it is somehow doped but this is very uh, unclear to us that how it is doped it is an intrinsic semiconductor and the charge carriers is very low because the high band gap in the polymer. So how the charge can be introduced here so that was the you know, big question here. So what we tried is we try to make some kind of change. So we change the thickness of the semiconductor and we see that the capacitance changes. Okay, this part is changing. So if you take this kind of slope, then we see that the slope is changing. That means in principle, the doping concentration is changing. Okay, so which is not possible with thickness, right? So that is one thing like the previous things is not actually happening. Okay, and as we change the metal, we see again this characteristic changes it is you know for aluminium it is just like a flat structure so something is happening here if you have a different metal you have different injection barrier and that is playing the whole role i mean entire thing is happening because of that so we we, we just came up with this idea and we told that it's okay no in, unintentional doping so till now whatever is mentioned as, a, as a, some kind of doping it is actually not happening but the metal is playing the major role and we, we came up with that we, we made this uh, you know theory based on that i'm not going to the details of that so as you in, i mean as you put this gold or whatever electrode so from the beginning without applying any voltage you'll already have charge inside the semiconductor it's injecting from the metal okay without having any voltage now with voltage only this distribution changes and sometimes it looks like a metal sometimes it looks like an insulator and that's why you will have a different capacitors for it okay so that is something it's, it's, it's very fundamental understanding from a lab and i think it is something very major uh, you know challenge to the community so now uh, uh, so we made the theory and all these things i'm just skipping that so some i mean i'll, I'll, I'll skip with within two minutes so this is something we have developed uh, with uh, uh, venkat uh, professor uh, dr venkat kishnan as a very good friend of mine and we started some activity together because he works on some of the small molecule organic molecules so he came up with some idea that okay if you can you know make this kind of structure and if we lock it so that is something called link lock synthesis we can make it so it will be like a butterfly structure and it will be very much planar okay and it will have extended pi conjugation can be very crystalline so can we make such structure and can we fabricate the transistor so that's why we started with so the initial is that the first result was uh, not very good. Obviously, it's uh, frustrating, but but there's some hope that you know that changes. It it the, 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 the gate voltage as it is more negative, the current is changing. So some signature is there, and if you look at the mobility, is really poor. Nothing is there, and what we see is that as there is some kind of contact effect might arise because this homo level is very very deep, whereas uh, we are using gold. So gold. Uh, form level is uh, minus 5.2 so which is very uh, very much i mean there is a huge barrier here so change the structure to make homo a little bit closer to the goal we got some mobility uh, cast film and the annual film and had actually two orders of magnitude higher mobility which is something positive uh, then what we uh, i mean uh, well, okay the solubility is some issue so why don't we try something because the film was not coming very good solution was not very uniform so to make that uh, he made some of this change so to have better solubility what he saw is you know even anil that cast they are almost similar so there was no change in the film morphology and the mobility was quite you know uh, sustained in this in this number further improvement was done and it's very interesting actually this just structure is this methyl and this hexyl group i mean they are just interchange and what you found is it's a very high mobility i mean quite high i mean two orders of magnitude and this is the number where most of these commercial uh, commercially available materials are also of that great so it is very interesting to see such kind of and it's a very nice uh, you know kind of crystalline structure is coming well, we could not continue because uh, the student already did. So it's I think Ram Krishna made this one. So he left his he, he has done his PhD. So it is done. So 
but that is uh, very fun for me I mean, for us and we do so many this kind of things like in solar cell and various things we try to understand something and, and try to do some interesting research so that's all about uh, from my side uh, this is my uh, you know, the group members some of them already graduated uh, yeah these are the collaborators as i told that i have materials somebody synthesis materials i have collaboration with the revised people i have collaboration with circuit so this uh, try to build uh, try to reduce the gap uh, the knowledge gap between uh, between us so that's all about it thank you very much well uh, so let me ask one question to sure. begin with uh, uh, so mobility, the last example that you talked about, mm -hmm. small change in the structure brings a very large change in the mobility and uh, we, you wanted to do more studies, etc. Okay. Chemistry, of course, is a very diverse thing and so many hundreds of uh, thousands and millions of modifications Correct. Uh, in this. So do we have certain understanding as to in this kind of confined rigid structures by whatever kind of chemistry that one does how can you take structures of the former kind which are low mobility to high mobility are there some guidelines are there some principles that one can suggest uh, a uh, and if that is so how can organic chemists implement obviously these two together would make it a good contribution and i see a significant amount of theory uh, coming into this correct, so correct. Uh, how do you how do you respond to that see one thing what uh, we saw even i have also uh, from chemistry point of view I, I may not be able to answer much detail but what we saw is you know one thing is this how the conjugation is uh, so that is very important part where uh, there will be good conjugation between the molecules, they can talk to each other. And another thing is how planar it is, because say at the end, uh, it is not a one molecular structure because it, you have to make a film and that film is, uh, you know, it should be as much as plain. So if it is a planar structure, so then they create kind of some sort of crystallinity. Crystallinity, it is not like single crystal, but uh, I'm taking it all telling that, that that is called like kind of order. Okay, so if you make that order, then the talking between the layer to layer would be easy and that way the because the charge transport in this material is happening uh, through the hopping transport so if you have this interaction very close enough then you'll have a nice hopping transport and that way mobility will be increased so it is not only the structure even as i i just, I just saw i mean how the film is coming so it, more to do not only from the molecular point of view but also from the supramolecular assembly point of view correct uh, these these this transport will be essentially controlled by that and that is where maybe some amount of computation some good amount of probably new studies with uh, cryo electron microscopy and some new kinds of uh, structure uh, structure property correlation uh, yes. becomes useful yes yes that, that I, I, I truly believe to that one. And I, that's actually the biggest challenge. I mean, as I, I showed in the first slide, that what are the challenges? Actually, the major challenge is the more material because from the chemist point of view, okay, you can see this as many materials, but we don't know which material to use. And at the same point, there is not no talking between the you know device and the materials because who are synthesizing may not know which material is good for that. So that's why, you know, we need more understanding, we need more talking to each other uh, to come up with... with, so with the other next support. question that I have is that in the institute, the larger group uh, in the institute, over 40, 45 people, is materials, uh, soft, hard, um, whatever kind of material. Yes, yes. And in that thing, uh, a, a sizable portion is related to sensors. And you touched upon something in the beginning, and I was uh, curious to know, uh, among those materials, of course, graphene, etc., are mm -hmm. fascinating, but in the case of real world challenges that one wants to address, uh, some of those material systems of relevance to specific sensor problems of the country, uh, there might be a, a larger effort uh, that okay. you can do. And this is, this is one such example where in small changes in the structures give you something very different. And these very small uh, changes, uh, when that should be in a position to add some fluorescence or something onto these systems. Yes, 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 it, it could be. 
it could be yes so actually i mean that's why i mean i'm actually quite excited on on, on these properties and truly speaking i mean uh, I, I looked at from that angle like what, what exactly the property is and how to tune those property to make us you know sensible sensor okay so that's that's uh, some of these things uh, we're, we're trying actually yeah. okay are there questions we have a quick one pradeep yeah go ahead jasundar uh, actually uh, so much is a good presentation uh, thank you i i just uh, the same line what pradeep was asking uh, the first uh, clarification i have uh, you had this one at earlier present uh, i think slide 23 or 24 so is that yeah this one is c6 h13 is it like a, uh, a linear or it's a linear yes it's a linear yes so have you have you checked increasing this carbon uh, chain uh, the lin linearity uh we have not checked it uh, but uh, see this is uh, the one thing is uh, this this makes one thing uh, which is important is for the solubility so that helps uh, the solubility part okay yeah. that's one thing and uh, i mean uh, if it is more actually it will be a problem because that may not be a good structure i mean they may not have a because it will actually disturb the other molecule to come around okay, okay. so it should have some sustain so c6 h13 is it's i think hexyl group it's good because it's normally the pth to use which has a hexyl group so i i think based on that uh, well i am not very expert on that yeah, maybe so think that can answer see this that one you are speaking chemistry <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 that's fine but another I, point i wanted to know probably this is a question to venkat also i just saw he yeah. is also there uh, just wondering is it like a really synthetic challenge to dope something in this molecule uh, what pradeep was asking to see any any property change uh as such it is no 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 it is not difficult to do but uh, you know do in a sense like changing like with some spacer like sulfur mm. or boron or anything mm. inserted whether that could impart some different properties yes it is possible i think venkat would be the right person to uh, yeah, tell that <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sh shall i go ahead uh, sure sure my yeah, yeah. yeah. just few seconds um uh, sundar this is not difficult synthetically one can manipulate introduce new atoms into the structure like in the carbon that you see in the middle of both the hexyl chain yeah. one can have sulfur one can have nitrogen uh, right now we are constructing st structures based on sulfur with the same design actually yeah okay so that can be synthetically done easily yeah no problem yeah. we have not but just that we have not examined its characteristics whatever you introduce uh, venkat without yes, bro, using this element called boron sundar will not be happy <laughs> <laughs> no i mean if you look at the the graphene borophene i mean this is a correct, huge correct, correct. difference correct correct borophene and like this would be the material for future but if someone can make it in quantities okay are there other questions i have a very quick question manu here Yes, ah, Manu. Yeah, uh, a very nice presentation. So, okay, very thank you, thank question. you. Sure. Uh, you have used very large drain source voltages, like a hundred volts and fifty volts, such yes, as the one yes, here. Yes. Uh, is that common to use very large? Uh, no, it is. Uh, it is common to use as far as research. Uh, I mean, as far as publication is concerned. But truly speaking, if it is an application, you have to reduce to ten volt, five to ten volt. So uh, that is that is doable with using some high di high dielectric uh, material. Okay, so that is possible. No, I am referring to drain source voltage, not the dielectric. Like no, drain source voltage also will be reduced because oh. uh, ultimately uh, the all the current, all the voltage scale. Uh, I mean, it will be scaled actually if you use uh, uh, high K dielectric, which is which is doable. I mean, this is the next part we are trying actually. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Then let us uh, move on. I suppose. Right. Okay. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's Stop and, uh, let's go to the next uh, presentation. And next is uh, by uh, Kumar. Yes. Yes. Can I share my screen? Please share and uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, we are at six uh, thirty. We have about twenty-three minutes. Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. Just mute all the microphones, please. 
I think. Uh, am I audible now? Hello. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Ratna Kumar. I am uh, uh, in the, from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So I'm going to talk about uh, the numerical modeling of uh, photo and thermal response to liquid crystal in films. Uh, and mostly the talk is going to be very uh, brief introduction to the system. And then we will see how we are going to model some specific uh, uh, systems of certain applications. So I'll start with one uh, video, which actually shows the mechanical deformation of a liquid crystal film, which is a cantilever. And when it is uh, exposed to UV light, it bends. And when the light is off, then it unbends. It is uh, more or less pretty much reversible. Uh, so it actually can go to several cycles. Uh, you can repeat this uh, process so that by, uh, by exposing the structure to light, one can obtain mechanical deformations. And we'll see whether we can control these deformations in the way that we want. So that is the motivation for this talk. So liquid crystal polymers are uh, uh, basically uh, they, they class of material that indicates uh, uh, a li a liquids with some order. So this order can be a positional order or orientational order. And uh, depending upon the order and depending upon the way that these things are arranged, we have uh, different classifications. The one of the uh, the central uh, molecule of these systems is this uh, rigid rod-like mesogens, uh, which are uh, non-flexible, and they are attached to these side chains, which are uh, flexible. And if you uh, compare this structure with this uh, cartoon shown here, so these rod-like structures, which are rigid, is uh, represented by this mesogen, and these side chains are the ones which are actually flexible and then they uh, connect with the polymer backbone. And these liquid crystal polymer systems are uh, characterized by a parameter called order parameter. Yes, uh, when this order parameter is equal to, uh, uh, depending upon the value of this order parameter, you can say that they are isotropic or anisotropic. Right? When we say that they are isotropic, they are uh, representing general liquids. And in these liquid crystal parameters, the order parameter will go, uh, will be greater than zero and up to one. So one means perfect order. So depending upon the way these directors or these misogens are oriented, we have uh, different classifications. The first one is isotropic. That means these misogens are not having any specific uh, orientation. So they are not randomly arranged. And uh, smectic uh, systems, which have long range positional as well as orientational order, something like this. They have positional order as well as ori orientational order. And the uh, other class is pneumatic systems. They, they have long range orientational order, but there is no positional order. That's how uh, broadly they are classified. And we are going to talk mostly on these pneumatic systems in uh, today's uh, talk. And depending upon the orientation of these mesogens with respect to the surface of uh, the film, uh, they, are, they can be classified as planar or homeotropic. When the uh, director is oriented parallel to the surface of the film, then they're called planar oriented films. And if it is perpendicular, the director is uh, oriented perpendicular to the surface, then they're called homeotropic orientation. And you can also have situ uh, systems wherein on one side you have planar orientation, at the other side of the film you may have uh, uh, homeotropic orientation and such systems are uh, also called uh, uh, spiral pneumatic oriented systems, uh, sorry, uh, pneumatic uh, systems. But here we can see the orientation alignment. One can actually program these orientation alignments. For instance, if you see this green one is the thin film and these uh, gray uh, surfaces, the gray, gray colored systems represent uh, the glass slides, for instance. So you can actually code these glass slides with certain orientation uh, alignment materials such that on the top you can actually uh, have a um, uh, planar oriented system or, or a homeotropic oriented system. Here you can see the director orientation. At the bottom you can have planar orientation, right? And as a result, you can have true thickness variation of this orientation. And that is one of the very interesting uh, aspects of these systems, which actually give you certain 
property gradients through the thickness because just because of the orientation change through the thickness. Okay, and these uh, alignments can be done through different alignment materials or uh, using electric or magnetic fields. Okay, so you uh, this is at one location, but the similar orientation variation can actually be incorporated in these systems along the length of the. So you can actually create a grid. And over the grid, you can design systems with the different orientations for each pixel, for instance. So if you have these uh, in-plane uh, uh, changes in the orientation, one can generate very complex uh, uh, deformations when it is subjected to light. For instance, if you see this, uh, zoom into this uh, top view of the glass slides, you can have different orientations. And because of these orientation, depending upon the orientations, you can actually generate uh, different kinds of uh, liquid crystal systems. And when they are subjected to, uh, when they are exposed to light, they can have different kinds of deformations. You can see here, it's a flat plate, uh, glass, uh, flat liquid crystal layer, and which with a orientation of this kind, and that uh, sort of a orientation when it is exposed to light gives a deformation of this kind. All right? Excuse me, I think. Uh, We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, but I, I unfortunately my computer got struck. I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, so uh, we can actually play with this orientation and then create the deformation. So, but then we need to understand what is the uh, mechanism behind this deformation when these materials are subjected to exposure to light. Why do they deform? And typically, there are different kinds of external stimuli. One. Stimulus can be light, another stimulus can be heat. So the when you uh, heat the material, then also they may actually deform. So here, if you uh, this is a particular uh, orientation, uh, when this system, this liquid crystal system, which is this particular director orientation is heated, then what happens is the mesogens start rotating because the entropy of the system is increased because of the temperature, and then they start rotating. As a result, the entire uh, system deform. So if you see the way that these are uh, uh, rotating, you can see that along the director, the liquid crystal actually contracts. So if you see this dashed line is the original configuration and the uh, solid lines represents the deformed configuration. So along the director, they actually contract and perpendicular to the director orientation, they expand. Right? And now these are all your general mesogens with which you actually build the liquid crystal. And now, if you replace some of these mesogens with some light responsive mesogens, then what happens is the light responsive mesogens will uh, respond to the light and then create certain kind of deformation. Right? One such uh, interesting light responsive mesogen is azobenzene, azochromophore, uh, which is having two states. So when uh, in its stable configuration, this appears as a it appears in trans state. When it is exposed to light of certain wavelength, then it actually undergoes a phase transformation. It goes from trans state to cis state. And when it goes from trans state to cis state, it actually bends. And that bending deformation uh, together with the backbone the polymer network will actually create the macroscopic deformation in the system. So when you are exposing the light, the basic uh, mechanism is the phase transformation from the trans state, state to cis state. However, this cis state is a metastable state, which means that as soon as I, uh, uh, the light is removed from the system, that means that when you switch off the light, it actually goes back to the trans state. So this is a reversible uh, uh, transformation. So here earlier in this previous slide, we have only shown the uh, general mesogens uh, with which we have constructed the liquid crystal system. And if we replace some of these mesogens with ajo, uh, based mesogens, which means these guys are light response. When you subject them to light, then this is in trans state and that actually goes to cis state that bends. And along with it, it will bend the, it will actually create the bending deformation to the entire network and as a result, the network deforms. Right? So here, you, uh, as we have already said, it actually goes from trans state to cis state. And then uh, upon the removal of light, it goes back to trans state. So there are here, if you uh, if we carefully look at, there are two pathways for this deformation. So when uh, light is exposed to this azochromophore, that actually changes from trans state 
to state to cis state, which is called photochemomechanical deformation. That means only because of the uh, change of uh, trans state to cis state, you are creating this deformation because of the bending of this model. And the, at the same time, this, uh, this process also generates some heat. That means uh, the molecule, when it changes from trans to cis, it actually generates some heat. And because of that heat, the uh, system, this uh, general azo molecule, general mesogen, can actually rotate as I have shown in the very first scenario. That means there are two pathways. One is photochemomechanical and photothermomechanical. So these are the two pathways through which the deformation can happen in these materials. And so uh, that means these uh, two events are causing local eigenstrains into the system. This eigen, uh, these strains are called photostrains, can be written as uh, the contribution from photochemomechanical part and thermomechanical part. Right? It is very similar to our uh, uh, bimetallic strip problem, wherein you have two different thermal expansion coefficients and then uh, the material bends, or even if you have same thermal expansion coefficient and if through thickness, if you have temperature gradient, then also the material bends. Something like this is the second term. And the first term is representing your transpersis uh, configuration. And your NC is the concentration of cis molecules in the system. Okay, so the, that's what actually here. So when you switch on the light, then this system actually bends depending upon uh, what which side is, this light is exposed, whether it bends towards the light or away from the light, depends on whether you are having a uh, planar side or homeotropic side exposed to the light. Okay, so here, uh, this is pure planar orientation. This is pure homeotropic orientation. And this is uh, when you change from planar to homeotropic, or you can also change from homeotropic to planar, depending upon which direction you have light. Such a system is called splayed pneumatic system. So we'll be mainly focusing on these three systems in this lecture. Okay, so we have looked at this photochemical strain, which is uh, coming due to transis isomerization. And this PIJ is called photoresponsivity tensor, which, I, which is very similar to if you would think uh, like uh, thermal expansion coefficient, if you want to make a parallel. And this is what is our uh, photo strain. And when this uh, trans molecules uh, transforms to cis molecule, so what fraction of them uh, uh, change and what is the uh, rate at which they change? So this is basically the trans cis reaction rate, which is a function of number of trans molecules and cis molecules. And there is also another term. So this basically this is this term represents the forward reaction. That means trans changing to cis. And this one represents the backward reaction. That means cis changing to trans. And the third term actually represents a thermal back reaction, which means even when there is light, because of the uh, thermal uh, loads, so the, there may be uh, transfer uh, from trans to cis. And when you switch off the light, and uh, in the presence of just the uh, thermal load, the actually send, uh, the trans can transform to cis and vice versa, right? So I'm not going to go into details of these equations, but what I wanted to uh, show you here is that you can actually use this uh, equation to uh, solve for number of uh, trans molecules or cis molecules that are present in the system at a given instance of time. And always, of course, uh, you have to have a conservation of uh, the species. So NC should be equal to one minus NT. NC is the uh, cis uh, fraction and NT is the fraction of trans molecules. And here you have two parameters, important parameters, alpha and beta, as you can see here. This alpha can be thought of as forward reaction coefficient and beta can be seen as the backward reaction coefficient. So alpha represents the forward reaction, that means trans to cis, beta cis to trans. All right, so if you take a film and if you uh, uh, expose light on one side, through the thickness, there, the light intensity reduces. That is what is something called light attenuation. However, this light intensity depends on the local trans and cis, con uh, uh, cis concentration. So taking into account of local trans and cis concentrations, we can actually uh, evaluate the local intensity as a function of depth through the thickness of the film using uh, this relation, which where d t is the uh, uh, attenuation length, trans uh, isomer attenuation length, and cis attenuation length and so on. So 
uh, using this equation, you would be able to actually calculate what is the true thickness intensity at each and every position through the thread. All right. So we can, uh, this is the, trans, uh, the transformation rate. And if you would evaluate what happens at steady state, that means at steady state, this, this guy goes to zero. And then you, one would be able to calculate the trans molecule at any position through the thickness and cis molecule concentration at any position through the thickness. And you can, using that information, you will be able to evaluate your, uh, you, you will be able to solve this equation and identify what is the true thickness intensity variation. And at the top surface, when uh, there is no attenuation on the top surface, so the intensity should be normalized in intensity should be equal to one. So here, uh, by solving those equations, one would be able to see what is the uh, concentration of uh, cis molecules through the thickness. And you here, alpha actually represents forward reaction coefficient, which means if alpha is larger, then the forward reaction is more efficient compared to backward reaction. Okay. So as you increase alpha, that means you are, you are able to transfer, uh, transform more trans molecules to cis molecules more efficiently. And as a result, as you increase alpha, you see that the concentration of cis molecules is higher. And which here on this side, you are seeing the, uh, the intensity. And as a result, the intensity is also high for, as you increase the forward reaction coefficient. And of course, uh, when you change your orientation from planar to homeotropic or plane pneumatic, where, uh, where you go from uh, uh, homeotropic to planar and planar to homeotropic, you see that the concentration of uh, cis molecules change through the thickness, depending upon whether you have a planar oriented film or homeotropic oriented film, right? So R, when you have a plane pneumatic film, it actually uh, be between these two guys, depending upon the thickness, right? This is case one is for thickness a T by DT five and case two T by DT 20. So this is T by DT 20 and this are blue and this is for the case one. Okay, so let us see what is this model, uh, the, the complete model, which actually takes into account of uh, mechanical deformation. Also here we have discussed uh, until now this photomechanical mo photochemical model. And from there, you will calculate cis molecules concentration from which you can actually calculate the strain, photochemical strain. Sorry. And then from uh, here, from photochemical equation, you can actually calculate the local intensity. And from that local intensity, you will generate heat because the local light intensity will generate heat. And then you can actually solve a trans heat transfer equation through the thickness of the film. And that gives you the temperature distribution through the film. And that gives you the photothermal strain. So it's a photochemical strain, and this is photothermal strain. And using these two guys, you will have total strain. And the total strain, this is actually is very similar to uh, the eigenstrains, uh, that is uh, uh, eigenstrains in the film, and then use that to calculate the elastic strain from the total strain and the, uh, the photo strain, and use that to solve your elasticity equations. All right. So we, we have uh, this system and uh, developed uh, the same thing in uh, Abacus, a finite element code called Abacus uh, using our own uh, user routines so that we will be able to solve these system of equations alongside the finite element equations from the mechanical uh, part. So first we will look at uh, the bending uh, 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 experiment that I have shown in the very beginning, wherein uh, we have shown a, a film subjected to light bends uh, when exposed to light. However, in this example, I'm going to show you uh, a system where it is subjected to heating rather than light. So uh, what here, what we uh, see is that we can, through thickness, we can actually change the director orientation. Because of that, the mechanical properties themselves change. If you keep, uh, look at this uh, previous equation, this is the stress strain relation. And here you have the elastic property matrix. This elastic property matrix will not be an isotropic matrix, isotropic matrix in this uh, liquid crystal systems. Rather, it will be a transverse isotropic matrix. That means there is a directional dependence depending upon how the mesogems are oriented. And as a result, you get some true thickness gradient in the material property. At the same time, you also have true thickness gradient in the uh, concentration, which actually results in uh, true thickness uh, strain gradient, which actually re, uh, leads to the bending of the film. So here, uh, one ex uh, example where people have shown that these liquid crystal films, when they are 
heated because of the truthness gradient in the temperature and the uh, uh, and also the mechanical properties they are shown to be bending or rolling into tubes however you can see that there are only two uh, layers you can see that it it was it was able to rotate into at most one or one and a half rotations then uh, uh, with our collaborators we actually thought we can we actually develop a system wherein we can generate more number of uh, rotations not one or one and a half rotations but if we can go about more number of rotations then we thought about uh, coming up with this idea wherein we have a tapered film rather than a uniform thickness film so that through the length along the length the bending stiffness is changed and as a result you may be able to rotate roll them into more number of probes right so here you can see this experiment where uh, the film is heated and you will see that there are uh, the number of rolls are more than 3 actually here so we have also done these simulations using the model that has been, that, uh, that was discussed until now wherein we were able to show that this guy can actually make more number of rolls because of the fact that it is having along the length tapering so we used the composite shell elements uh, so that uh, true thickness variation of the properties can be modeled within a single shell element and the how did we achieve this uh, property variation so uh, we have measured uh, the orientations through the thickness under sem and then identified what is the orientation planar 45 degree and homeotropic depending upon what was observed in the experiment the same uh, material properties have been used in the simulations true thickness by 50% homeotropic 25% 45 degree and 25% planar that actually dictates how the curvature of the system is going to evolve when it is heated up so this is how this comparison between the experiments and simulations although simulations over predict a little bit because uh, in the experiments there are some uh, addition addition that uh, creeps in at a higher temper uh, at a long, uh, longer times and which is not modeled in the simulations but rather the if you compare the curvature it matches reasonably well at low temperatures so that is one uh, problem that we have studied and then uh, our collaborators uh, uh, were working on another interesting problem wherein they have made a triangular uh, liquid crystal film which is kept on a hot plate and this uh, ratna kumar you have consumed 22 minutes already yeah i'll be done in 5 minutes yeah, yeah. so uh, they have uh, done this uh, uh, triangular film and it is kept on rocking so it is it's a self sustained rocking and then they also did another experiment wherein they actually kept a uh, rectangular film and it turned out that it was not able to rock it is simply toppling so we would like to we wanted to understand why this is happening and then we actually developed a model and then came up with an hypothesis wherein you kept a, a, a triangular film and because of the fact that this is initially having some free bend and this uh, the triangular film is in contact with the hot plate along a particular line and that will be a, uh, at this point the temperature will be very high and as a result then along the length you have a gradient in the temperature and that gradient is actually causing it to bend in one direction compact and then uh, the other uh, this part comes in contact once this part comes in contact here the temperature is going to be higher and then as a result it again topples this way and so on as a result it continues to uh, oscillate right so that is uh, that, that is a hypothesis and then we actually simulated this uh, system and then uh, you can see that this is the contact point and the contact point is moving as a result this guy is uh, oscillating back and forth so the idea here is that here you have the initial contact line and uh, this uh, this is the initial let us say initial flat structure hello you're all right something you're trying to remove yeah no I, it has i don't know why just, yeah okay i'll move on so the temperature distribution along the film is varying in such a way that there is an asymmetry that is created because this contact line is actually moving from its center of gravity to another position as a result this asymmetry is causing the uh, film to rock rock and roll back and forth okay. 
you seem to have rolled too many times that your computer is unable to roll. For no, no, no. My uh, computer seems to have some issue. I am not sure. Uh, I have not actually gone. I am trying to close this, but I'm sorry about that. It says 57 GB, uh, uh, Ratna. <laughs> yeah, but it should handle 57 GB. No, no, no. It is not 57 GB. There is something wrong there. Yeah, I'm very surprised. Yeah, yeah. It won't be. It is actually 38 MB. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'll try to join. Uh, give me a minute. I'm just joining through. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me share this screen. Oops. Can you allow me to share? I'm not able to share. Because you have, no, no. You have to first pull out from the previous one. Still, oh. still being saved from your previous uh, computer. And that, that I got that disconnected from that. I don't know oh, why it is oh, not. Okay. I'm sorry for the mishap. Yeah. That's fine. I can, stop, uh, I can stop your screen anyway. Yeah, yeah, please. If you can stop, that will be great. Yeah. We can go ahead now. Yeah, yeah, now I'm going ahead. Or we can take some questions. It is uh, already time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll uh, sorry for that. I'll just uh, show one more uh, simulation and then just stop it. So we've actually used this uh, knowledge that we have gained through this uh, rocking simulations to see if we can create rolling motion in these uh, systems. And then uh, it, it, it happens that we were able to actually simulate the four wheel cart made of liquid crystal films uh, as shown here. And then by showing the light in a particular direction, we were able to move it back and forth by changing the direction of the light. And it, it was also, we, we were also able to see if we can rotate, if we can actually do the turning of this system. By, play, by providing different uh, intensities of lights for the outer wheels and inner wheels. I think uh, I'll stop here. I already uh, taken more time. Sorry for the uh, mishap. And of course, I would like to stop by uh, discussing some open challenges in this area. First of all, uh, so far, whatever modeling that we have done is, uh, is with the assumption that the material is elastic, linear elastic, although anisotropic. But these materials also have some viscoelastic uh, behavior, which needs to be taken into account. And uh, several properties of these systems are not very clear yet. And, uh, and the most important thing, if at all we want to use them for uh, soft actuators, the fatigue response of these systems is still an open question. And uh, to my knowledge, there is no study on the uh, fatigue response of these systems or the failure. And of course, uh, these systems as of today are not energy efficient. Uh, when we say that the amount of energy that you put in to actually create actuation and what you get out is uh, uh, very uh, encouraging at this point of time. So maybe uh, in future, we will be able to address some of these questions. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, I would like to thank my collaborators and also the funding agency for uh, the projects. Thank you very much. Well, we have taken, thank you for the presentation. We've taken about 29 minutes. So we don't have much time uh, to, but let, let's uh, probably spend some five minutes on, on questions. And I already see that uh, Madhav has raised his uh, hand. Let me begin by asking a question. When you start looking at a, a system which is undergoing an electronic exploitation and associated uh, transitions and things like that, they are governed by several rules. Mm -hmm. uh, an important, obviously, is electronic uh, structure related rules. Uh, and then uh, there are symmetries and conservation and all that uh, comes in. 
Uh, so while on the one side, I see that interesting analogy uh, that is that is there with uh, in, in the calculations, looking at the kinetics of these events, uh, looking at the way, way in which heat transfer is happening and how it is dissipated. Uh, all of these uh, are apparently very nice and uh, correlating very well with the experiments. I see that electrons have to be added here. <clears throat> Uh, and electrons and associated complexities of electrons. So I wonder how is that coming in and are there open challenges out there? Uh, uh, Pradeep, uh, so the models that I have shown you are uh, continuum models. So there is no way that uh, we could actually bring in uh, the, uh, not even at the atomic level, if, uh, if not uh, when we are talking about electrons. Right, uh, so we have not done any uh, work in that direction. And uh, there are uh, some works at least at the molecular dynamics uh, level where people try to measure these properties. For instance, that I said uh, about the photoresponsivity terms, right? So they sort of simulate uh, the transis isomerization through molecular dynamic simulations. And then they try to estimate these properties. And there are very few studies and they're only picking up now. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh, in estimating the properties of these materials uh, using uh, uh, first principle calculations or even uh, molecular dynamic simulations. But in this uh, work, whatever I've shown you, it is con completely continuum. And hence, uh, we will not have any information with regards to uh, events happening at that uh, micro scale, uh, at nanoscale, at so electron level in the molecular motors and molecular kind of literature where mm -hmm. there is a correlation between such molecular events um, and and the associated mechanical uh, movements so that is where a significant amount of overlap can happen and so i was curious to know uh, mm -hmm. what is happening in our our at our place in this directions you know that was the thing to ask that question. Yeah, well, I, I am not aware uh, if anybody uh, in uh, who is working in that area, I am not aware because my work mostly has been in the continuum level, but I, I, I completely agree with you. I think we should uh, do uh, careful uh, literature search in that direction, how people are working in that direction. Some amount of that has been happening in uh, TIFR and some of the uh, people who have been interested in uh, trapping molecules and doing such studies. Uh, mm -hmm. Something is happening in Chennai too, uh, but I do okay. not know to what extent these studies have extended in Madras. Okay. So that was the reason. And let me take uh, these other two questions here. Uh, uh, three questions are there. Madhu, first. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So I had a question regarding the photochemical model. The, yeah. the part before you went to the thermomechanical part. So, yes. so, so the photochemical model, as I understood, uh, it looked like a mean field model. Because yes, yes, yes. So the photochemical part. So you have some average fraction of, of some uh, quantity of, of the number of different types of poly, uh, different types of liquid crystals, right? Yeah, Mister. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so now now these quantities are not local quantities, right? NC is not a local quantity. Right? It is it's a local quantity. Through thickness, it actually changes. That's right. It's a but, but, of but are you are you considering it as a partial differential equation as a function of x y or is this solved in the mean field limit? No, it is uh, uh, solved as a function of uh, the space as well. Okay, so it's okay, okay, so okay. I just wanted to clarify that. So yes. so n c and n t are all functions of x y, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Yeah. Okay, there are other uh, questions as well that I, I see. Somio there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, nice uh, talk. So, one thing I just wanted to know I mean, like the first experiment you showed, there is uh, some light responsive uh, part is there. So, uh, I mean, how much it is uh, related to the light and how much it is related to the heat? Because I see that even uh, this can also yeah. heat it up, right? So, that also yeah. can create. So, whether you have taken that uh, into account, like, 
so uh, we can actually in these systems you can add molecules which are responsive to heat and uh, which are primarily responsive to light right here the chromophores are uh, mainly responsive to light however because when there is light there will be some internal heat generation correct, correct. and because of that internal heat generation the general uh, mesogens might also uh, actually rotate which causes some strain so here uh, when we have done these simulations we have only considered only one one of them because we didn't have the information at that time about uh, what is the split up okay let's move on uh, venkat you have a question yeah uh, ratna kumar uh, yeah. nice uh, piece of work what i was wondering was about the azo benzenes that you have been using mm -hmm. to do the photochemical reversibility Mm -hmm. uh just curious whether there are any other molecules uh, that can do the same reversible process be applied for this kind of uh, yeah uh, there are other emotion. molecules as well uh, okay. one molecule that i am familiar no that i know are drma uh, that that can also do that uh, but there are also at least uh, four, four to five different options that we could use but i don't remember the names as uh, as of now because uh, mostly what is the important criterion that one should look for because we work on uh, spiropyrans and benzopyrans mm -hmm. they also do such kind of photochemical reversible process from a colorless state to a colored state moment you switch off the light they would come back to the colorless state okay uh -huh. during this process they do undergo a huge uh, amount of molecular motion okay oh okay so just wondering whether those kind of molecules uh, uh, have been used to such kind of studies if not why not that is the question Ah uh, okay. So uh, the the foremost requirement is that uh, it is changing from one state to another state, but that state should actually have a mechanical deformation associated with that. For instance, if you see the azo uh, chromophore, it has uh, in uh, trans state it is a striped molecule, and when it goes to cis, it actually bends. Correct. So the bending amount of bending is what is causing the mechanical deformation to the system, and that is uh, the foremost requirement. and uh, the other requirement is uh, that the chemically whether it is uh, uh, compatible or not that's uh, that to my knowledge that is what is requirement okay iri mashahira iri has shown the same kind of motions on crystals actually single crystals okay uh -huh. so and he has also demonstrated that it can move a nanoparticle of about uh, i don't remember the size probably 20 micrometers oh okay. it could it could move the nanoparticle actually that was a nature paper so uh -huh. i was just wondering whether any other systems that are explored and why one what one should keep in mind before deciding these properties thank you okay thank you very much i would like thank to you talk to you uh, offline thanks yeah sure thank you thank you all right let, let us move on thank you ratna kumar so uh, thank you let, let's move on and the next uh, talk is uh, by hemachandra Yeah, thank you professor adu and venkat can you lower your uh, hands okay yeah i just start sharing my screen just a moment yeah. you can uh, see my slides right yes so yeah uh, good evening everyone uh, thank you for this opportunity so Uh, i will slightly shift the gears from you know organic electronic uh, electronics from uh, organic electronics to you know soft matter so this is also kind of soft matter but biological soft matter so uh, i am hemachandra i am a new assistant professor new faculty in the department of chemistry it's been around 8 months since i joined so most of the work that i am going to present is from my post doc uh, at mit so i have a, i have a lab but i still have to do some active research here so uh, bear with me with that and so i am basically my lab is basically a biophysical lab biophysical chemistry lab where i look into some of the biophysical studies using spectroscopy and i am mostly interested in single molecule enzymology and the specific systems that i am really interested in are systems that are actually act as mechano enzymes so i'll talk about it uh, in detail uh, a bit later but basically what i am looking at are the enzymes that act as proteases remodelers and disaggregators so basically these apply mechanical forces and change the conformation of the protein and so this is what uh, these are the biological systems that i am very interested in and in particular there are specific properties that i am looking into to understand so i am more into understanding the fundamental aspect of these mechanoenzymes so in the sense like what are the forces that these enzymes apply on proteins 
how much forces can they survive before they deform uh, the structures and if because they are all mostly uh, molecular motors so what kind of motor mechanisms do they follow like uh, uh, do they follow a, a, a power stroke motion or concentric or a sequential so different kinds of uh, yes come in yeah so uh, what are the different uh, motor mechanisms that they follow and in particular i am mostly interested in two process called unfolding and decentralization so before going into uh, details of my talk so i uh, i I just wanted to give a brief introduction to uh, people who had no bio background. So basically, proteins are formed from a linear chain of amino acids. So these are called peptides. So these linear chain of amino acids fold into a nice secondary structure, which further form into a, a tertiary structure, and this is called as a folded protein. And folded protein is is known as a workhorse of a workhorse of a cell because these are the molecules that actually perform most of the functions in the cell. in addition these proteins can come together or they can form further quaternary structures and these are called enzymes and these enzymes are basically nothing but biocatalysts and these enzymes perform various activities in the cell and as you know uh, a, a, any reaction requires a catalyst especially in a biological system you need to have a catalyst and enzymes act as bi uh, biocatalysts so in particular uh, a particular a uh, high class of enzymes that i am really interested in are called mechanoenzymes so these are enzymes that are more like piezo motors so they convert one form of energy to other form of energy in particular they convert chemical energy into mechanical energy and this chemical energy mostly comes from hydrolysis of nucleoside triphosphates like atp gtp and other kind of nucleoside triphosphates so basically these convert this chemical energy into mechanical energy and they use it to perform various cellular functions So, for example, some of the functions that these mechanoenzymes perform are very common in the uh, in a cellular system. For example, protein unfolding. So, uh, and when any protein has to move from one compartment to other compartment, or when it has to be degraded, so it has to be unfolded. And so, these protein unfoldases use this particular uh, uh, so uh, uh, energy from the hydrolysis of ATP. and in the other process like protein translocation as i just mentioned proteins have to move from one compartment of the cell to other compartment of the cell so th that is where uh, uh, these mechanoenzymes take part and then protein disaggregation where uh, they, when the molecules come together when proteins come together they form large aggregates that are very uh, uh, toxic to the cell and cause multiple diseases so these aggregated proteins have to be folded back into the native structure and that is where uh these enzymes are useful and you mention any cell in any process in the cell for example dna unwinding or cargo or molecular transport in the cell so all these processes just these are just few examples so all these process are carried out by a class of enzymes called mechanoenzymes or in other words they are also called as molecular motors because they convert chemical energy to uh, mechanical energy now uh, my lab or uh, basically is particularly interested in three different processes that is protein unfolding which is carried out by unfoldases translocation carried out by translocases and disaggregation carried out by disaggregases so th uh, this is just a schematic based on the uh, available structures so how a protein applies mechanical forces so this is a protein structure and that so uh, this was a previously a folded structure of the protein so it uses this chemical energy from atp hydrolysis and the conformational changes in the protein or in the enzyme drives or converts that into mechanical energy and applies forces on the protein to unfold the protein and that further those proteins are translocated and uh, whether it is a tra translocated or degraded so the other process happens so in uh, to understand this particular class of enzymes that can enzyme single molecule enzymology has been extensively used and i don't have to uh, reemphasize the need of single molecule measurement so single molecule so most of these enzymes work alone in a cell so it's not like they work in a group so when you have a heterogeneity in their function you need to understand how each molecule behaves so as one of a famous saying goes uh, if if we are very really interested in the molecular mechanisms what we have to do is you have to go down to single molecule level and see what is the heterogeneity in the mechanism of those molecules what is the stochasticity and are there any rare events and do, do those rare events are the are those rare events important for the function of the cell and how do they contribute to the overall uh, mechanism of the uh, enzyme and in uh, in particular as we were just uh, the, as previous speaker mentioned so uh, when you are measuring properties like you know uh, mechanical properties especially anisotropic properties 
that are very dependent on the direction in which you are applying so for those kind of measurements you need to you need to go down to single molecule level and you have to do a single molecule measure so for the past decade or so there have been a multiple tools that have been developed for single molecule enzymology both tools that actually act as monitoring techniques where you just observe the molecule without perturbing the uh, system for example fluorescence based techniques like you know fluor uh, single molecule fret or fcs or conductivity based measurements like you know nanopore measurements or you can have manipulative techniques where you can apply forces on the molecules and or measure the forces on the molecules or measure minute distances for example techniques like optical tweezers single molecule afm and magnetic tweezers so 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 uh, in particular my lab is mostly interested in optical tweezers and to some extent single molecule afm to understand the biological processes that i uh, mentioned before so these are the two biological systems my lab is Uh, currently working on one is a proteasome from mycobacterium tuberculosis so this uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, organism or bacteria is very uh, is a, is one of the well known bacteria in the sense that you everybody must have heard of mycobacterium tuberculosis owing to its potential uh, 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 owing to its you know pathogenic nature and causing uh, tuberculosis so this particular organism has both proteases and proteasomes that actually convert Uh, that, that actually degrade these protein molecules into a uh, smaller peptide molecules so my lab is particularly currently interested in understanding what are the molecular mechanisms by which these proteasomes unfold and degrade these proteins into small peptides and uh, so how do the single molecule tools add to that and the other process that our lab is looking at is to understand from the same organism uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, uh, enzyme called disaggregate so this enzyme actually disaggregates proteins so basically as i mentioned so when you have large aggregates in the cell it is very toxic to the cell and the cell has to get uh, get rid of that so how do these enzymes called disaggregates apply mechanical forces on these large aggregate molecules and how do they fold them back so that uh, the uh, cell retains its original uh, you know its native uh, state so so these are the two enzymes and the two uh, from system that we are really interested in and for this we will be uh, we have been using both biophysical and single molecule uh, techniques but today i'm going to talk about only a uh, specific uh, uh, work that you know a little bit of work and why why we need because based on the theme of this meeting so we are we were needing some computational support and where we were needing computational support and how could computational uh, simulations would have uh, yeah, extended our results or gave uh, uh, how they would have given us further information based on the theme of this meeting i'm only going to talk about specific uh, uh, specific uh, results that where your target where the uh, computational results would have been uh, more helpful so as i mentioned um, uh, we are looking into a specific process called protein degradation where the protein is degraded into a uh, small peptide molecules so this is carried out by uh, two classes of enzymes called proteases and proteasomes so uh, how, how uh, so basically both biology and chemistry has to be uh, depends on specificity you can any enzyme cannot randomly degrade any protein so there has to be a specific signal that has to come from the protein molecules and then the enzyme recognizes that signal molecule and during consumption of as i showed you before it consumes atp and then converts that chemical energy to mechanical energy and unfolds and degrades so this is basically the schematic of how the uh, this process of protein degradation happens so you basically have a folded protein and when you have atp consumption atp to adp so this during this cycle of uh, uh, chemical uh, this cycle of hydrolysis of atp the energy is used to basically pull all these protein substrates and then those protein substrates are unfolded they are translocated and then they are degraded degrade is nothing but you know uh, it's basically hydrolysis of the peptide bonds and then those are uh, formed into small uh, peptide fragments so here what we are specifically interested in are two mechanical steps which is basically pulling on the substrate which is uh, during unfolding and then translocation once the protein is unfolded it is translocated into the chamber for degradation so these two are not these are not diffusion controlled reactions these two are mechanical steps where the enzyme actively applies forces on it so in order to understand uh, the forces that the enzyme applies and how does the force manipulate it we have resorted to a a single molecule technique that is uh, there has been all like that that one noble prize couple of years back which is basically optical tweezers 
I am not going into details of you know how optical tweezers works and how do we do that, but I just want to emphasize that basically we have two lasers in which two uh, dielectric particles, especially here we are using streptarbon coated beads. So we trap these particles and we covalently link enzyme on one bead and the protein substrate on the other bead. And then we monitor the distance between these two beads in order to look at how the process of protein unfolding and transcription happen. So from these assays, we basically get uh, three different information, or uh, three kinds of information. Why, uh, one is based on unfolding, we can determine how long the protein is or how much of the protein has been unfolded. And then we, we can, from based on pre-unfolding well, we can say how stable the protein is, like how stable, how much time the enzyme takes to unfold. So this is determined by both how, uh, how efficient the enzyme is and also how stable the protein is, and then further translocation. And this clearly tells us how fast the enzyme moves on the translocated substrate. So today I'm going to talk about three different uh, 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 questions that I've been trying to address. One is enzyme, uh, where computational simulations would have been uh, more useful. One is enzyme-mediated protein unfolding kinetics, protein unfolding pathway, and protein translocation. Now, before going into the uh, uh, detailed results of that, so I wanted to introduce you the system, which is basically a protein called I27. And we tried to understand the unfolding and degradation of this particular protein by an enzyme, both from its N terminus and C terminus. So uh, basically, for those of you who are non-chemists, so basically any protein has two termini, which is basically N terminus and C terminus and amino terminus and carboxy terminus. So when you basically unfold it and translocate it, you have the stereospecificity changes as well as the structure, the local structure at which you are unfolding also changes. So uh, I, I was showing you a very, you know, a cartoon representation of how, what results we get from these optical tweezers. And so these are the real data. These are, this is how it looks like. So when you do it from N terminus and C terminus, and you can see the, we are talking about uh, in, a, in a distance in the scales of, you know, tens of nanometers. So you can see how, uh, how, uh, how, uh, accurate it has to be in terms of you know uh, determining the uh, determine the lens of the uh, unfolded proteins and other things so first of all i'll uh, talk about uh, 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 unfolding kinetics when you have an enzyme the enzyme unfolds a protein it forms uh, basically it forms an unfolded protein now if you do a bulk study if you do a spectroscopic study or an absorption so what you do is you take molecules in a test tube or you make take molecules in a uh, Cuvette, uh, we basically measure the absorbance or fluorescence, and you have a single value and you repeat it, you have a slight error bar. But when you are doing a single molecule, it's the same enzyme working on the same substrate, but at different time intervals, and you can see the time uh, time scale on the uh, x-axis. So with, basically, it's the same enzyme, same substrate, and you can see the stochasticity of this process. So basically, you can clearly look at, so the enzyme, at some extent, can take, you know, less than a uh, uh, 0 0.01 seconds, and in some instances, it takes around 100 seconds. So this is a surprising aspect that we get from single molecule studies that how much, he how heterogeneous the molecular system is in the sense like, we generally assume a kinetics for a process. And so you have a, a you have a value, uh, which which is given out. And so we assume that the protein or the, the entire process happens at that rate. But you can see how stochastic the entire process and if you remember the last uh, last month when we were having uh, the same meeting, uh, Professor Arthur Duva from uh, our own uh, department was mentioning how difficult it is more it, to model the single molecule, you know, kinetic process. So generally, enzyme kinetics are modeled pretty well by uh, uh, Michael Schmenten kind of equation. But but these single molecule stochastic kinetics cannot be modeled by those. And so so it, it is still an open problem how to address uh, how how do we model this. Uh, unfolding kinetics obtained from the single molecule data, and uh, why, why are they stochastic, and what was stochastic, and what are the what are the factors that contribute to the stochastic nature of uh, such process? Now, coming back to uh, uh, that's about single molecule data, but coming back to the exact problem that we are looking at. So we are basically looking at how do these proteins unfold? Uh, well, how do the process look when they unfold from two different directions, from N terminus and C terminus? And it seems that so it's, it's so always the same protein and same enzyme. So the local structure of the protein seems to play a major role. And depending on the local structure, you can uh, either unfold the protein much faster or much slower. So this has a uh, role to play in uh, in evolution. In the sense, many of the proteins have a specific tag either at N terminus or C terminus. And over the time, it 
might, it must be an evolutionary uh, uh, reason why a, uh, why certain protein fibers get entered into the cells, and depending on the local structure of the protein and how fast the enzymes can actually unfold them, so the tag uh, evolution might have occurred. And uh, come, uh, talking about the next uh, question that we were interested in is basically looking at the protein unfolding. Now, if you look at so this is the part that I talked about when I mentioned protein unfolding. Now, so there is something called kinetic partitioning, where when a protein is unfolded from a folded state to the unfolded state, it generally goes in a two-state manner. In the sense, there is a folded state and there is an unfolded state. But what we observe is that there is a kinetic partitioning in the sense that there are certain number of molecules that actually take this two-state pathway, and then there are certain molecules that take three-state pathway. So that means, so this, this if you do a bulk study, if you do a normal uh, 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 study using, you know, uh, mechanical unfolding using ASM or optical features without enzyme involved in it, we only see this particular state of the protein going from a folded to unfolded state. So using this particular data, we can actually model how, uh, what is the distance that the, that the protein gains. And based on the distance, we can actually calculate, uh, go back and look at the structures on, on the structure of the protein. We can look at where, how does, how, what is the unfolding pathway of that particular uh, substrate. And we can deduce information whether, uh, whether the, uh, the mechanical unfolding studies that we generally do using ASM and optical features, do they match with this enzymatic unfolding? And it seems that Enzymatic unfolding is a very different process than what uh, than a non-enzymatic mechanical unfolding that we generally study, and so simulating this mechanical un uh, the, the pathways for this unfolding is is definitely an open question in the sense because the, because a large number of atoms that are involved as well as substrate protein substrate and then there is enzyme so because of large number of atoms it is not easy to do an atomistic simulation so this is something that. Uh, that can be very helpful, uh, in, uh, or it's an open question where uh, uh, if you can understand how do enzymatic protein unfolding differs from non-enzymatic protein unfolding using simulation, so this is uh, going to be a very, uh, this will contribute to the field of protein folding, and I don't want to emphasize on the importance of protein unfolding, but that is something that is a very open question for uh, people who are doing computational simulation. Now, uh, third, third, part of the talk is basically trying to look at protein translocation through the enzyme. Now, as I said, once a protein is unfolded, it is actually translocated through the enzyme, and this translocation actually results in uh, uh, further degradation. And so th these are nothing but chains of amino acids. And what we see, so if you remember the unfolding part that I mentioned before, that process were very, was very stochastic. In a sense, you can see that the, that the unfolding the rate were very diff, uh, diverse. Whereas if you see the protein translocation, it is basically the protein translocation is more or less very homogeneous, uh, uh, more or less homogeneous. So this is again, in a sense, like uh, why does a, why do those external factors play such an important role and why do they make the entire process stochastic for unfolding? Whereas those processes do not tend to affect the translocation. One reason is that probably the biological water around the enzyme is affecting when it is in an unfolded state. But whereas when the protein starts unfolding, you, you have hydrophobic residues here. And so the biological water might not play a major role and so thereby reducing the stochasticity. But these things have never been, you know, these are all uh, hypothetical hypotheses, but never have been, have been verified uh, using either by simulations or experiments. So, one thing that I want to emphasize is that so basically there are such, these are the translocation where the protein goes from a unfolded state and it basically the enzyme moves from the top of the enzyme to the bottom of the enzyme. So what we see is that when the enzyme moves from moves along the polypeptide chain, there are these regions where the enzyme stalls or stops and what we call them as pauses. So basically these are called pauses and that I'll talk about it uh, more in a couple of slides. So. We can also get more information on these translocation in the sense, how does this enzyme move on the polypeptide, like what are the step sizes it takes, and whether, it, uh, as I mentioned, it's not a diffusive process, but it is more like a you know, stepwise uh, process where you have a power stroke uh, during every ATP cycle, you have an enzyme moving certain distance. And you can also under, uh, look at what is the average step size in the sense, how much does the enzyme move? Is it one amino acid, two amino acids? or five amino acids, so how much does the enzyme move when it basically moves on every step size? And how much does the enzyme, or how long does the enzyme wait before taking each of those steps? 
So all this information can be obtained from these single molecule studies. And as I mentioned, so I wanted to emphasize a bit more on the pausing. So because this is where a computational studies could be very useful in the sense like, so there are certain regions when the enzyme moves from a top of an amino uh, fold, uh, a protein to the bottom of the protein, there are always certain regions where the enzyme stops or pauses during, these are called pauses. And so, and these pauses can happen multiple times during the translocation. And these pauses can happen for really long in the sense there are instances where these pauses happen for a minute or so. So currently we do not understand what basically leads to these pauses and what is the interaction between the enzyme and the substrate that is leading to these pauses. And because, you know, at the end of the day, although I drew all the cartoons, so these are all nothing but, you know, a chain of amino acids. So basically you have an enzyme and then you have a protein substrate and the enzyme is basically translocating these substrates. So these are nothing but your interactions between the side chains of the enzyme and the side chains of the protein substrate that are leading to these pauses. And uh, so it, it will be interesting to see what kind of interactions lead to these and why, why are they why are they so so different in the sense why do some enzymes stall for a few seconds whereas some stall for a few uh, minutes so this is something uh, that is not understood although there have been attempts uh, at understanding this entire process of uh, uh, protein translocation using computational simulation for example uh, people have modeled it using as a, as a you know uh, using coarse grain methods uh, like go model and other things like try to look at it but the main, or uh, so for example, here uh, they have taken an example of a uh, protein with its structure and try to look at the protein translocation. The problem with these coarse grain models is that they don't have a lot of side chain information, or uh, because proteins are both backbone and side chain, they don't do not have that amino acid information, and they just take it as a you know uh, as as uh, as homogeneous uh, molecules. So we really do not understand uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, these uh, interactions, like interactions between different uh, protein, uh, different amino acids, and why do they pause? And uh, uh, yeah, what you, you've taken about 23 minutes. Can you conclude sure. in two minutes? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so we do not understand that. So you can understand, like uh, you can ask me, like why? Why is it important to look at this pausing? Why is this translocation so important? Is there an application for that? Yeah, for theoretical point of view, these are pretty interesting. But even you can see there are there are certain applications that are. Uh, stemming up uh, in the recent times. For example, DNA sequencing is very well known, but protein sequencing has been limited for due to various factors. And one of the most commonly used ways these days for protein sequencing is to use these enzymes and look at how they actually translocate these substrates. So if we can understand the interaction between different amino acids during translocation, we can actually model that and get that information to look at uh, to, to basically apply this for uh, nanopore sequencing by this uh, ATP unfolding. So uh, I'll thank basically I mentioned so most of this work has been done in my postdoc and uh, some of the work I'm planning to do especially with the mycobacterium tuberculosis at IIT Madras. Yeah, thank you. Well, very, very nicely presented, well within the time and uh, all that is very nice. So I have one fundamental question that is chemistry uh, wants to optimize energy. Yes. And so I thought that anything that becomes energy, chemical energy becoming mechanical energy and subsequently used for any purposes, that is less efficient than a direct transformation that one would like to do. Mm -hmm. So energy to mechanical energy, and finally it has to become chemical, of course, oh, yes. because since, you know, self-organization and all that kind of protein yeah. folding, all of these have to happen, which is chemical. Right. So why should a biological system right. go through a mechanical process? Yeah. And and what is the advantage biology is gaining? Perfect. Yeah. So so as I, there is no concrete answer, but you know based on my understanding of that. So chemical energy is pretty homogeneous. You can you cannot apply a to a specific because in a cell there are no compartments for each of those processes. Every pro so it's a basically it's a it's a mixture. So when you there is ATP hydrolysis, the energy that is released doesn't pertain here. It basically distributes. Whereas biological processes have to be very specific. So. So as I said, there is a chemical recognition tag that the enzyme does. 
So, but when it has to pull, only this enzyme has to pull that, but this energy is dissipated, but because it is closer to this, so the enzyme uses that to do this pro specific process of unfolding or specific process of translocation. So although it's an energy consum consuming process, but the reason why chemical goes to mechanical and then chemical is because mechanical is more directional and very specific to in that particular uh, sense. If there are no, uh, as I mentioned, ATP hydrolysis, for example, if it happens, if you cannot control that, it only uh, affects this particular enzyme. The other enzymes around it, around it would also be affected. And so I, 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 from my understanding, I think that is a major reason, although it's a biologically exhausting process, you cannot, because you cannot have compartments for each process in the cell, the cell has optimized or evolutionary looked at having a more directed processes by doing this large, you know, chemical, mechanical, chemical process. Your studies, the way that you have uh, shown, they, they have water in that or? Uh, yes, these it? are all in buffer conditions, like uh, the uh, uh, you know, very close to physiological condition, except that we don't have a cell environment, but these are very as close to the uh, physiological conditions as possible. All right, let's take Sanjeev's question. Um, uh, hi, Hima, thanks. Um, so, uh, so my first question would be along the similar line of Professor uh, Pradeep. So, uh, so uh, you said you, you do this experiment in solution. So uh, now my question, can you hear me, Hema? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So the, my question is, how do you pull the substrate through the enzyme? Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, as I said, I didn't go through the experiment process, but I'll quickly, very quickly show to that. So that's uh, question number one. Question number two is how how does it differ from AFM? Oh yeah. So so how we do how we pull it is basically you we basically have a, a, a two traps basically we have two dielectric particles and on one enzyme on one on one bead we have the substrate protein on the other we have enzyme and we mechanically bring them using P zone and okay. then once there is a chemical bond between these two. We pull this slightly back, but it's not too, uh, you basically uh, pull it slightly back so that the, uh, the, this interaction is still intact. And then the enzyme starts doing its process of, you know, uh, during ATP hydrolysis, it starts uh, unfolding the protein and transmitting. So, so did you say that your uh, enzyme is in one compartment and your substrate to start with in the other compartment? Um, I know it's not compartment, so it's on one. So basically, it's a dual trap optical pieces where you can trap, where you have two lasers. Okay. Trap, so you can trap uh, simultaneously. I see. Okay. Okay, that, that's one question. And uh, how how does it differ uh, from it? Yeah. So as I uh, just briefly told, so it does differ. So in none of the AFM studies show that it actually uh, goes through because the problem with AFM is the amount of forces that you have to apply are much higher to unfold these proteins. Whereas enzymes can do it in an order of magnitude lower forces. So the unfolding pathways seem to be very different uh, in AFM unfolding compared to enzyme action. Also, perhaps you will not get the dynamical information of what you'll be getting here. Yes, yes. Yeah, the same. Yeah, um, by the way, so I'm Sanjeev Sanapati from Biotechnology. I do mostly all atomic molecular dynamics of proteins. Yes. We also do coarse grain. Uh, so, so it, it would be a pleasure to talk to you offline and see if we can tie up on something uh, of yeah, mutual right. interest. Yeah, because Yeah, and I, I think uh, I, I'm talking next month. If it's not next, uh, next to next, and then uh, uh, it would be nice if you can come and then see where you can march. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then, okay. Are there other questions? Are there other questions, colleagues? Otherwise, let us move on. Nahama Chandra, thank you very much. And next uh, speaker is uh, Tarak Patra. So let him introduce himself and get going. OK. Uh, so uh, thank you, Professor Pradeep, for these um, wonderful initiatives. And I'm happy to be part of it. And uh, thanks to uh, Suraj also for all the communications and other logistic and um, and thank you all for attending these sessions. Uh, I'm Tarok Patro. I'm an assistant professor at chemical engineering. Um, so as you can see that um, I kept a very broad title, uh, integration, integrating AI and 
molecular modeling for accelerating materials design so i kept it a very broad title instead of uh, you know instead of coming up with a one single problem and go into more technical details of it as the scope of this meeting is to know each other work and look for um, and collaborations and other interaction so i i take a collections of problem where ai and molecular modeling can be used or we are using it and um, and i'll take uh, one by one and then uh, we'll see if, you know uh, all the discussions at the end so uh, let me begin with mentioning my primary tool uh, my primary tool is uh, is of course uh, of course molecular dynamics or molecular simulation so i treat uh, a molecule uh, by classically by a spherical bead which are my atoms this is a, a polystyrene molecule and as you can see that i try to write down the interactions between all those atoms and molecules the bond angle torsions and pairs and and um, an electrostatic interaction so it's all a classical representations and um, once i have a potential energy surface of a molecular descriptions i can run a uh, very simple uh, uh, newton's equations of motions or monte carlo simulations to collect uh, the ensemble of uh, molecular conformations and from that uh, molecular conformations or the ensemble i use very standard or established statistical mechanics principles to estimate and compute properties so everything is classical i don't have any uh, schrodinger cat in my computer simulation it's it's purely uh, boltzmann statistics okay and um, as you can see that you know there are different levels of uh, molecular simulations um, i start from this classical very all atom molecular simulations and there have been many recent efforts to build model where things are much more coarse grained for example here the you know ch3 or ch2 or ch groups are combined into one single bead or atoms and as you move from very more detailed atomistic model to more and more coarser level of description you lose the accuracy and um, there have been many efforts to kind of coming up with potential energy energy uh, surface of these higher level descriptions uh, where you can try to match up the you know uh, properties or accuracies of this uh, of more atomistic detailed model system that looks like a very you know never ending endeavor in, in theoretical chemistry so we look into you know different levels of um models different uh, level of descriptions of molecular structure depending on what properties we are interested in if it is very uh, properties like viscosity is glass formation which are very you know longer time and length scale we sometimes come up to the very coarser level of descriptions or if you are looking into let's say ion transport or electron transport uh, in a in a polymer medium which i to uh, stick to more of a atomistic models of descriptions okay um so as you can see that you know in 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 our simulations we try to have this kind of hundreds or 200s of polymer chain they could be something close to let's say 10 nanometer cubes of sample that's what we simulate and you simulate it for let's say nanoseconds or so but then we try to predict properties of 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 real materials you know this is the uh, polymer in my computer simulations and this is the polystyrene this is the real materials and often times many of the matches and i i got surprised and got skeptical about it when things match when things have too much of agreement i always prefer a little bit of disagreement uh, because you know because of this discrepancies of line and time time scale and and at the same time many things we don't incorporate into our model and that uh, would be easy to explain little bit of discrepancies um so but as you can see that you know taking this 10 nanometer cubes of uh, material simulations we were able to uh, compute properties like glass transition temperature uh, thermal conductivity viscosity surface tension and so on and often times they have very good agreement or or close agreement with with many of these experimental systems so i work on a very broad class of soft matter systems here is some of the uh, simulations which we have done in recent past from polystyrene to acrylic acid isobutylene and and even 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 very small molecule like glucose or or orthoterphenyl uh, so all those molecular systems everything is represented in a very classical uh, atomistic or little bit coarser levels of descriptions and we try to uh, look into their structures dynamics and phases as a functions of temperature and here is one figure where i am showing the relaxation time of molecular segment as a functions of temperature if i am pulling the uh, systems all of those systems 
and the relaxation time is, is going up. If you're a chemical engineer or process engineer, you can think of it as a viscosity because uh, relaxation time of segment and viscosities are, are um, kind of um, uh, commensurate and they monotonically increase or decrease. So if it's a high relaxation time corresponding to high viscosities. Um, and you looked into how uh, different materials fall out of equilibrium, form glasses and so on. Um, to link with, um, with the SOMOs or in the very first uh, presentations today, you know, there is a, he was talking about mobility. You know, there is a huge range of mobility uh, in these kinds of polymeric systems. And certainly we can engineer the molecular architecture, do the molecular engineering and design to attain a desired range of mobility uh, uh, by changing molecular conformations in that level. So this is a kind of summary of many different polymer systems we study their fundamental aspect, their aggregation, self-assembly, glass formations and crystallizations and so on. Okay, so that's- uh, Dr. Patra, I have a question. Uh, I think Somyo talked about electronic mobility. So I don't know how you get that from here. Uh, uh, I guess it is, it is structural mobility. If I look into the last slide, he was showing that two layers of um, uh, materials or, or, or molecules. It was like sliding what he was saying that crystal that was talked about was the electronic mobility brought about by change in the structure. I see, I see, okay, okay. So maybe I have mistaken then. I thought it's a, it's a you know, uh, okay. uh, classical so. mobility. Okay, thank you, thanks for the clarifications. So yeah, so that's my primary tool, which is molecular dynamics simulations and Monte Carlo simulations. And my second tool is machine learning. So I'll talk about the machine learning in the context of a very specific problem. But let me uh, uh, let me kind of talk a little bit about what are the different um, problems which we are trying to address in my research group. Um, as in the previous talk, there was a lot of discussions about the single molecule structures and dynamics, their folding, aggregations, coils, and globules, and so on. We try to build very simple bead spring model to, to kind of understand the structure uh, phases and polymer scaling relations under different confinement, under, under substrate. So this is one area we, we spend a good amount of time to build very simple uh, bead spring level of model and then the glass formation, which I have just mentioned in previous slides. And we looked into uh, iron containing polymer, which is the polymer which could be in potential materials for solid state uh, battery applications. I'll come to this part in more details, but this is one of the polymer which we are very much interested in. And the, and the next class of polymer is a sequence specific polymer. So all the biomolecules which we looked at, um, they have all biomolecules as a sequence effect, all their structures and properties they have somehow correlated to their sequences. But in synthetic materials or, or synthetic um, uh, polymer, we have not explored much of the sequence effect. So in today's talk, I would like to talk about how sequence can tune materials properties, particularly in the context of uh, synthetic materials. And I also looked into composite systems like polymer nanocomposite, how polymer nanoparticle interactions can be uh, exploited to, for different kinds of self-assembly of nanoparticle their aggregations or some kind of gel formations and so on. And the recent, really we have started looking into uh, kind of self healing properties. Let's say there is a nanoparticle which are grafted or tethered by small ligand or polymer. And if you apply a mechanical strain and there you'll be able to see uh, microscopic fracture and how materials use some of those uh, polymer properties like elasticity. Sometimes people talk about entropic elasticity because of long polymer, they have a high entropy and that uh, the, the contributions of entropy and elasticity can be also exploited to, to design and understand these kinds of material. So, so these are the spectrum of soft matter systems, which um, I have been working on since my PhD and postdoc and now as an independent PI. Uh, so with that, I would specifically talk about three problems uh, with a little bit more details. And I'll, uh, these are, they are uh, energy storage materials, which is the polymeric ionic uh, liquids and self-healing materials and the sequence defined polymer. So I'll go one by one, try to give a little bit more flavored and, and, and scope of these uh, different materials and their modeling, what we are doing. Uh, so uh, so uh, for example, this current lithium and batteries, their electrolytes is, is liquid based. So it has the stability issues and, 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 and high energy density issues. So one of the propositions is to use, uh, you know, uh, ion containing polymer as the medium for ion transport in the battery. But the challenge here is that if you take a molecules and polymerize it, 
and look into ions motion through that uh, uh, polymer matrix, the conductivity, the ion conductivity suppressed significantly exponentially as the molecular weight of the chain length increases. The, uh, the other few challenges, like if I looked into the conductivity, the conductivity of ions in a polymer matrix, and these are the different polymers and different uh, combinations of ions have, have tried out experimentally. And uh, this is the range of conductivity we, we achieved so far. And typically liquid-based uh, polymer electrolyte having a conductivity of this range. So certainly there are a couple of order of magnitude we are, we are below from the current liquid-based electrolyte which are used in, 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 in polymer, in, in, in battery materials. But one striking feature here is to see that this conductivity of ions and I'm plotting X axis as a, as a relaxation time or segmental relaxation time of polymer. They have a strong coupling. So that is probably the, the, the most important bottleneck in designing polymer for energy storage applications where this um, low segmental dynamics of polymer try to suppress the conductivity. And um, uh, the, the challenge in design perspective is to kind of decouple these motions. So we are looking to different polymer and different kinds of morphology architecture to see how we can achieve that decoupling. And I try to mention some of those challenges here, like um, we need to have high conductivity and high mechanical properties, low glass transition temperature. Those are very antithetical. If one goes up, other goes down. So can you design or do some uh, molecular engineering to have a uh, you know, target um, range of conductivity as well as as a mechanical property. So these are some of the things which we are trying in our group. And here are some, some results where you can see that we take uh, um, ionic liquids and polymerized ionic liquid and simulate and try to measure their conductivity as a function of temperature and look into what, um, uh, you know, what kinds of chemistries can, can give this kind of push in terms of their conductivity. Um, and, um, and as I was mentioning about the decoupling thing, you, you have come up with a quantity to decouple uh, these two motions and you look into how the decoupling motion is correlated to any other molecular scale property. And one of the properties which you identify is that ion pair volume seems to have a correlation with the decoupling exponent. And typically for polymeric system, the decouples are high. Um, so we are looking into what exact kinds of chemistry, these are very coarse grain level of uh, description, but what exact chemistry can lead high decoupling, high conductivity and high mechanical properties. Um, so, and these are different kinds of um, polymer chemistries where we are trying, uh, here I am trying to represent them in a very coarse grain level. This is a very simple uh, um, uh, coarse grain representations of a polymer, ion containing polymer. And if you just take those polymer and throw into a medium or their melt environment, they try to form these kinds of ionic aggregates, ion channels. The, uh, the challenge is to have this ion channel from both anode to cathode their reversibility and how that channel responds in presence of electric field and so on. And we are looking into many different polymer architecture. For example, here, there's a glassy block, uh, which is covalently bonded to the ionic liquid to make it a dye block copolymer. And this glassy block can provide more of mechanical stability and this liquid block can facilitate ion transport. As you can see, these colored regions are basically ionic aggregates. And we also looked into hierarchical structures of polymer to see how long ion channels we can form um, in a polymer matrix and so on. And looking into their correlation between glass transition temperature, ion pair volume, decoupling coefficient, ion pair volume and so on. Um, so that's the kinds of uh, ion containing polymer for, for targeting towards um, uh, energy storage or ion transport applications. The second problem which I want to talk briefly about is self-healing materials. So we have done a simulations um, of, uh, of very coarse grain level simulations where um, you know a simple ligand or bead spring level of ligand are, are tethered to a spherical nanoparticle. This could be a silica or gold and this ligand can be think of a polystyrene, a short polystyrene or acrylate, uh, methyl acrylates and so on. And if you kind of let them assemble and form a thin film of um, those um, uh, systems uh, and then apply mechanical strain and particularly I'm trying to stretch it here in our computer simulations. And then um, at some point when I'm stretching, I release them to relax and it able to retain or recover many of those uh, macroscopic uh, you know, fractures is forming. So this, uh, this cycle of stretching and healing is something we have just started. We are trying to understand how the strain is correlated to the polymer which we are grafting, their molecular weight 
and how the correlation between strain and molecular weight what is the healing time what extent of healing possible and is it is it recyclable how many uh, cycles of stretch strain it can sustain and so on and try to develop some molecular level of mechanism to explain some of this behavior and uh, these are very large scale simulations like millions of particles are there these are run for let's say 100000s of core and so on and we are getting some excited results um, uh, to explain and understand this uh, healing mechanism molecular scale mechanism uh, and and hopefully understand uh, how materials can heal and sustain um so this is the problem i am going to spend little bit more time which is the inverse design of macromolecule and that's where i'm going to talk about machine learning aspect so let me take a uh, very uh, canonical example which is a polymer mixture let's say polystyrene and polymethyl acrylate they don't mix together and they form uh, this kind of microscopic phase separations and um, in polymer industry like emulsions or coating or car painting in all those industry they try to use some uh, compatibilizer molecule which try to reduce the surface tension between two uh, uh, between this immiscible interface okay and the idea is to, to to kind of physically place this molecule at the interface so that it can reduce the surface tension now here is a design problem that um, of course this compatibilizer contain chemical moieties of all those pure polymer which is styrene and and acrylate and the questions which i am asking is is what exact sequence you will covalently bond them uh, to uh, to reduce um, the surface tension to to the highest extent in other word what is the sequence of this molecule which will be the best performing compatibilizer of the systems so as i mentioned that uh, in synthetic uh, polymer uh, the sequence is something is not extensively explored typically we try to go by very block levels of descriptions like a dye block or some periodic uh, uh, block copolymer for these kinds of application all in academic research as well as industrial applications so i'm i'm just uh, let me just explain the complexity and challenges of this particular design problem let's say i'm trying to put a very short polymer which have a, which have a 10 monomer so the number of possibilities number of sequence are possible is 2 power 10 which is which is more than 1000 but if you take a little longer chain like 200 monomer the number of possibilities is 2 power 20 which is a, which is a million but if you go for n equals to 30 the number of possibilities is 2 power 30 which is a 1 billion and you can think of in experimental scenario where polymer are even larger in computer simulations we try to go by a very short chain but in experimental chains are much more larger so so ideally if you want to design this molecule i need to understand or, or screen this 1 millions or 1 billions of possibilities Uh, which is even today's um, computational resources or even experimental resources it's not feasible so we need to have some method some strategy to reduce the number of measurement in order to identify the optimal candidate so that's where we try to take help of ai and machine learning to identify smarter strategy which can reduce the number of measurements and instead of doing a millions of md simulations or billions of md simulations by doing just thousands or 500 of md simulations can you identify the sequence which will lower the uh, the interface energy of two immiscible polymer systems so um, we have adopted two methods i'm not going to talk uh, detail in the, how this method work but slightly mention and of course if anybody interested i'll i'll be happy to talk more offline so first method which we introduced or we adopted is is, is evolutionary computing we try to mimic the natural evolutions how species evolve um, and that concept we adopted for 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 molecular design uh, so in this scheme of uh, our flow we have a set of sequence maybe 30 40 sequence and you do their molecular simulations to identify what is their surface tension for this given applications and then out of this small pool of candidate we apply different um, evolutionary operations like selections crossovers and mutations to come up with a new sequence which might be better uh, in terms of their uh, their performance or in terms of their fitness and this cycle continues until we achieve something which is significantly better than a starting candidate or we are exhausted with our resources so that's some uh, something which is working very well we have very good control of how this algorithm work and we are applying it for many different problems not only the surface tension minimization problem so the other methods which we have adopted is is a gaming ai so in all board games you know uh, computer chess or or alpha go or tic tac toes 
all those computer games, and there is a base of those uh, game, there is an algorithm called tree search. It's called Monte Carlo tree search. Um, so we try to emulate those gaming strategy for molecular design. Um, so if you look into how those gaming algorithms work, basically you can think of a of combinations of these species is basically basically a microstate, a arrangement of, of different species. And there are millions of millions of possibilities if you can so keep rotating all different forms or king queen. And we try to identify what exact um, exact order or exact sequence you should have those um, um, uh, those structure which will give you winning moves. Okay, and we try to emu so I'm sorry if I'm 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 sounding very vague. Uh, which I am probably, but I just wanted to move on and show you some data instead of spending more time on the algorithm part. Uh, so that's how we kind of understand these gaming strategies and try to emulate these, combine it with molecular simulations. And here is a better workflow, how the trees are growth. And every time you are growing a tree, basically you do uh, computer simulations to get a fitness value in this particular case, surface tension and grow the trees. And, 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 and ultimately we end up getting a branch where where you identify some candidate which is very which is very superior than the parent node. So that's how it works. And let me just show you some results instead of spending more time on the algorithm part. So here is the results. If you see the first few sequences, these are the sequences which are human design. So we in academic research or in industry, we use these kinds of block copolymer or these kinds of periodic arrangement of moieties. And those are the things well studied and well used in their human design. And if you look into their surface tension values, these are the surface tension values. But here is a machine learned or machine designed uh, sequence, which is giving a polymer, which can make the surface tension zero, ideally zero. So uh, here is the sequence. You, you have used 22 minutes. Sorry? You have used 22 minutes. Yeah. That's yeah, okay. So just a couple of minutes, I'm almost done. So um, so here, I, here you identify using the help of machine, a sequence which can outperform all the human intuitive uh, designed molecule. And then we, we try to understand why this particular uh, sequence works better than the other. We try to develop some analytical uh, statistical physics based model to understand, for example, here you show, let us think that, um, you know, that polymer is, is basically one dimensional random work at the interface. And we put a lot of approximations like, like reduce um, um, the, uh, the energy contributions significantly low and we look into only entropy contributions. We come up with the expressions for, for entropy and put that and come up with the expressions for free energy and so on. And typically free energy should be, should be low. There's uh, the second derivative should be less than zero and so on. If you do this little bit of uh, statistical mechanics analysis and you can plot the entropy of those loops and the free energy and they will see that there is no specific mean block site which will give you the lowest free energy. So we sort of um, give some plausible explanations that uh, that having a block of shorter block and longer block combine them together that uh, will lead to the lower surface tension than having a very periodic arrangement of the block. So although this is not a very satisfactory um, or robust model, but but based on this analysis, we are able to argue uh, something along these directions. Okay, so that's what you know we combine. Uh, machine learning and uh, molecular simulations to to uh, kinds of looking into molecular architecture uh, which uh, can have superior properties and uh, and that is how you can tune the molecular uh, structures and, and materials properties okay uh, so uh, so we also developed um, ai platforms and tools to analyze molecular dynamics trajectories for example recently we have done something called dpoly which is the ai platform to analyze polymer trajectories to understand and predict what are different kinds of structures and phases exist in a polymer trajectory. Um, so basically take a polymer trajectories and predict whether the polymer is a coil or a globule or has a torus or some sort of stacking and so on. And uh, that um, we have tested it for a very simple uh, bit spin level of polymer and we are trying to explore many other complex uh, polymer architectures and so on. So that's how I, um, that's why I want to stop and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss and, and any offline discussions also, I'll be happy to participate. So thank you for your attention. Very nice. Uh, so in addition to these, uh, obviously such a uh, versatile tool can be applied for a number of uh, 
problems. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, very many of these are uh, becoming increasingly relevant today. So I wanted to ask you, um, well, you talked about uh, bulk properties like uh, surface tension or viscosity or uh, some form of relaxation and all that thing. Uh, are there ways by which you are in a position to explore finer molecular details uh, in systems uh, wherein properties that are the kind of thing that uh, that Hemachandra was talking about. So we are now getting into chemical to molecular or mechanical motion. Now, the earlier problem of uh, what, what Soumya was talking about was related to electronic properties. Now, there are, of course, limitations on each of these models. So I was wondering to what extent these uh, latest, the very last examples that you talked about, the AI methods, to what extent they can really probe the finer molecular material details, not organization, not the bulk properties. So you mean the experimentally, what details one can achieve? Well, experimental, of course, correlations to what extent. For example, you know, Hemachandra was talking about uh, an individual protein chain, to what extent or how a mechanical motion would happen for single protein chain, how this will separate out from the self-organized system and how would translocation occur in with molecular you know, steps, angstrom nanometer steps. I see. Yeah. So, you know, there have been uh, uh, many advancements in both experimental and um, and, and, and simulations uh, perspective. For example, when you talked about the segmental dynamics of, of a polymer, which is basically alpha relaxation, just atoms relaxing. And let's say how that atom relaxation is correlated to its glass transition temperature, which is very, very macroscopic properties. And there are models which can connect the segmental relaxation time uh, with that, with the with the with the kind of segmental relaxation time temperature correlations, and are able to predict uh, the glass transition temperature, uh, which are you know, very close to kinds of experimental um, observations of glass transition temperature. For example, sure. the other other problem which I talked about um, uh, the segmental motions of polymer and the larger ion diffusions in a uh, in a polymer matrix or the conductivity of my my polymer sample sample. Uh, uh, so that also we come up with some uh, correlations where the segmental dynamics as a functions of uh, no, no, the, the conductivity of ions as a functions of segmental dynamics. So that is also uh, in, in Berkeley, there are a few experimental groups. They're able to come up with very similar levels of uh, correlations um, and, and things are a bit consistent. The other thing which I would like to point uh, talked about is the is the length scale gap what um, what experiments and simulations deals with um, uh, the, the the nanometer or, or nanosecond is 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 the kind of time and length scale you are able to achieve. But many of those uh, conductivities or um, or um, or uh, glass transition temperature and, and every all those measurements they are of experimental you know minutes and seconds of time scale. So that 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 this um, that uh, that uh, inconsistency is always there. So one of, one hope is to this this coarse grained model, which is which is now kind of spearheading these days, coming up with a very uh, high level descriptions of the molecular systems and kind of so at the same time passing those informations from uh, from those atomistic levels of interactions and building those those. Um, uh, those larger length scale model. The issue is that uh, whenever we build a model, we try to write a analytical or mathematical expressions, which is very isotropic, you know, uh, having a functions of R. And many of those interactions, which are anisotropic, 
the pipe is stacking and so on um, things are uh, uh, things grow non linearly things go grow like a spec like a like a um, like a one dimensional or very lower dimensional growth uh, and those kinds of things will be able to achieve if we build model who, the the molecular model of higher coarse grain model which can which can um, which can contain those anisotropic interactions i think one of the directions which currently it is heading that use ai to build a model which can predict the energies and forces so ai has no mathematical correlation there is no r it is all everything is non linear so there is a hope that ai can capture those non linear interactions and instead of having a van der waals or, or linear jones uh, or interactions or um, or electrostatic interaction which is a q1 q2 by r1 r1 we can have a ai which will uh, predict the the energies and forces which we can take for our molecular simulations so these are some of the new advancement taking this play uh, uh, this directions where more and more anisotropic and um, and inhomogeneous interactions can be incorporated to to predict uh, you know more accurate uh, properties and develop more robust model sanjeev uh, you have a question uh, yes professor patil uh, so uh, uh, can i just add uh, a couple of sentences of what tarak said on your question yeah. so is basically uh, how you look at the god uh so so it depends basically what properties you are looking at so if somebody is interested to calculate the conductance or conductivity so there one has to go to a quantum calculation uh we are interested in you know side chain movement of a protein then we can go for all atom classical molecular dynamics tara wants to go even at a larger scale so he does coarse grain um and and then that's the limitation we cannot go beyond you know uh, we can go up to microsecond but the uh, experimental phenomena that happen in millisecond or second so there uh, at the best you can do what um, uh, ratna said which you do mathematical modeling you solve the diffusion equation and so on so but beyond that point uh, uh, you know uh, we we still have a mismatch between experimental and classification um so i have a couple of uh, quick question tarak um one is uh, you talked about ionic uh, polymers yeah and so, so right tarak yes yes so so my question is uh, how about the coarse field parameters ionic uh, liquids itself is a very new uh, class of molecules and then you are talking about ionic polymers why do you get the coarse field parameters yeah so um, uh, that is uh, that is probably the the biggest bottleneck now that we don't have very accurate force field for um, there are some ionic liquid uh, force field like uh, magines or or balasundarams and few other people right. have, but, but uh, they are, those are about ionic liquids and yeah, you are talking yeah. about ionic liquid polymers so there are one or two systems where we can see some uh, force field coefficient for uh, for polymeric system that's what we picked up for to do couple of those simulations and uh, often times uh, you know for example that uh, backbone uh, backbone um, uh, dihedrals or 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 angles some of those parameters are picked up from the uh, from let's say a polystyrene backbone interaction strains or so on okay so, so you basically are, you you pick them up from different molecules but you haven't you haven't optimized them for your molecule yeah, yeah. You, did you or you did not i did not that's why i'm trying to scale things down trying to come up with some um, some universal correlations which can be used to explain and um, that's why the the coarse grain simul the bit spring simulations which yeah. is like very generic there is no uh, these are all in lj units trying to see that those kinds of um, uh, structures are, are are feasible by 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 having just very weak linear jones interactions only and many of those structures which you don't know which we don't know that is possible in 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 chemically possible or not no but leonard jones uh, coulomb is still okay so my concern is about the torsion uh, until you you optimize them yeah. your torsion can go all random you know so yeah. they can be very different than what you uh, see in practice yes yes absolutely i i completely agree so that is where um, we have recently started uh, using ai to develop this force field actually right okay 
Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, that brings my second question, the D-Poly, uh, you said this is a software what you are developing in your lab? Yeah, so uh, this is just to analyze the molecular dynamics trajectories. Excellent. So basically, if there is a phase transition in taking place in a molecular dynamics trajectories, so these should be able to very accurately identify, let's say, critical temperature or critical parameters where transitions is taking place. Many times, um, you know, near the critical point, simulations might be uh, not stable, a lot of fluctuations comes up, uh, or you don't need to do a lot of simulations near the uh, critical regions. You can do it simulations just far away from the uh, critical point. And this method will be able to do these interpolations and extract right. Uh, but then, uh, but then, there you need a good amount of training set. You have to have, you know, uh, a big bunch of uh, training sets so that your prediction uh, is robust. So, yeah, where do you yeah. get all these parameters uh, for your training set? So, in training uh, set, are, what I am saying is that uh, I am generating data which is far away from the transition point. So I have generated data far away from the transition point okay. and take that data uh, hmm. for machines to understand that what are those pure phases mean. I see. And then I identified a way to kind of connect these two phases, which can give me the, uh, the critical. No, phase. but the point is if you yeah. take the input parameters again from your simulation data yeah. and if, if, if those contain some sort of error. So then basically that error propagates into your uh, prediction also. True, true. So we're assuming that the, 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 the pure phases simulations. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, I see. They have a coil and certain temperature, they have a globules or certain other phases. They are pure. And the other thing is that let's say we are looking into second order phase transition. So we'll be calculating let's say specific heat. Mm -hmm. and and you need to have have a large amount of ensemble to have a thermodynamically stable values of specific heat. And we don't need that large amount of confirmations for the training purposes, actually. We have shown that, um, you know, the standard way of characterizing phase transitions where you try to have, you know, some fast order, it will be entropy or volumes or densities or, or specific heat. Um, mm -hmm. and those calculations require large amount of confirmation, like right, for the ensemble mm -hmm. knowledge part. So yeah. here we can we show that at least you know uh, so let's say ten for six confirmations you need to average it and uh -huh. we, are, so we are saying is that we can take ten thousand confirmations to train our model so that way you don't need to generate a lot of data also even in the pure region yeah yeah okay yeah I, I then, think we, we can we can continue talking uh, yeah people Th must thank be you Th thank you thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rekwata, for this wonderful presentation. What has come out uh, today, if you have one or two more minutes, uh, is that, you know, it is, it is about uh, 1997. Someone called Breslau wrote a book. That uh, book is called Chemistry Today and Tomorrow. The central useful and creative science. And this was published by American Chemical Society, the central useful science. And what has happened today in these four presentations you see, it is, it is all the way revolving around that central theme that, that came out today. So I was so particularly pleased to, to see how this uh, not in an accidental connection uh, that, that happened around the chemical bond today. Uh, well, we will have more time to talk about these and related accidental connections to physics at some point in time uh, later. Uh, Suraj, next um, month we have uh, the speakers are lined up, I suppose. Yes, Suraj, sir. All the yes. people have agreed. Yes, sir. The next meeting is on June 19th. And the speakers are uh, Professor Sanjeev Senabadi, Dr. Sumesh P. Tambi, Professor Sridhar Kumar Narasimhan, and Professor Ramesh Gurdas. All these four people agreed. Okay, very nice. So, all, all those, then the subsequent uh, month also, we'll have to uh, ensure that these, these connections are established. 
All right. So Pradeep, are we having any students uh, any any time soon? Students presentation. You said something and bad. At some point in time soon, but let us let us have the of line course, of people. Course. Uh, and certainly there are some gaps and then we will we will take uh, some students and let us uh, do this for a year and after that let's see how things evolve uh, who has you know this, these are all efforts that on us to constantly put uh, time in to gradually nurture uh, and, and these things happen only that way so sure. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.